Okay, good. Uh, okay, excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, so that's uh, great. That's, this is the idea of being here is to support the uh, Anukampa Bikuni project, of course. That's kind of the, uh, one of the reasons why we're here. But of course, the other reason is just to you know, have some Dhamma discussions and some meditation together. That's, and that's what it all comes down to really at the end of the day. Uh, and everything else is to support that. Uh, so, uh, beautiful place, magnificent place. Uh, I've, you've done a very good, well, very good job, uh, Ani, I have to say. I mean, this is really uh, remarkable. Uh, so uh, there was foresight in finding a place like this. I think that's, that's wonderful. Anyway, let's get on so with some, some meditation together, uh, just to kind of uh, get ourselves ready. And if I fall asleep, then if someone can just block me on the shoulder, I'd be most appreciated. Uh, <laughs> let's see what happens. So, okay. Okay, so just uh, relax, uh, close your eyes, uh, and uh, the um, <coughs> marvel of closing the eyes is that you shut down so much of the sensory activity, uh, and you can actually feel yourself properly uh, once you do that. Uh, feel your body, uh, feel if you are at ease or not, uh, and just start off just by relaxing, being kind to yourself, looking after yourself, uh, because it is by looking after yourself that you are able to look after others. Uh, these things are not really separate as such. So now is the time to look after yourself. Uh, so just relax, allow things to be here. Nothing really is to be done apart from just uh, being here and relaxing and enjoying this beautiful time together. Uh. Meditation is a gradual process of letting go and that letting go begins with uh, allowing yourself to be at ease. Uh, it is all the holding on, all the doing, all the activity that makes you feel a bit tense or uncomfortable. Uh, and then by allowing that to be instead uh, and letting it go, uh, that is actually the beginning of this process. Uh, so sometimes Letting go is really easy, it's basic things like learning to relax uh, and allowing just the long day behind you just to fade away into the background. Uh.
And uh, perhaps the one of the most fundamental qualities required for meditation to work uh, is just the idea of patience, uh, the ability to wait, uh, the ability to allow the meditation to work by itself. All we have to do is just very gently incline the mind in the right direction. Uh, now is the time not to do, but just to be aware. Uh, now is the time to enjoy the peace, uh, enjoy the good company, uh, enjoy the beautiful premises, uh, and just sit back. Uh, and then as you enjoy uh, the spiritual aspects of life, uh, the worldly things tend to fade away. Uh.
Okay, so now let's take a minute uh, just at the end uh, just to review the meditation here this evening uh, just to get some idea of uh, what it means to let go uh, and what it means to develop the mind in the right direction. uh. Okay, <laughs> I just saw this big bell and I thought, become like a little child, you have to play when you see something like that, so you have to bang it, I wasn't sure what to do to end it. <laughs> so that's good. Huh? So, uh, okay, so welcome everyone once again. Huh? And uh, so uh, we have been given a topic, which uh, we'll see what happened with this topic. Yeah. It was I just as I just mentioned, I just arrived from Australia. It's quite a long journey from Australia, uh, and uh, sometimes when you travel on these trips, yeah, kind of things occur to you, obviously, because you are in a new environment and you see things in a different light a little bit. Uh, and uh, so, as I was traveling, I just remember arriving in uh, Qatar. I don't know if you've been to the Middle East. It's kind of a different world in the Middle East. Uh, well, even. <laughs> very hot for, for one. It's kind of, the, this is five o'clock in the morning, we arrived, it was 32 degrees at five o'clock in the morning, that's kind of the, the Middle East for you. Yeah. And so we, we come in and we're just arriving at this magnificent airport, yeah, this is the Hamad International, Airport. very magnificent, very uh, splendid, very kind of amazing, the best airport in the world and all of these kind of things. Uh, and we came in this enormous plane, there's one of these A38, is a double, you know, the double decker planes, yeah, kind of enormous things. Uh, so we're kind of docking into this thing, and uh, it was all very magnificent to walk into the airport, everything is just fabulous and amazing, yeah. And uh, I was, as I was kind of watching, seeing all of this, uh, yeah, you see all of these things, you kind of, you think how, what amazing it is, what humanity has created. Uh, how have we created this? It's astonishing. Everyone is probably just a bit like me, right? And somehow, by kind of, I couldn't even do the most basic thing, but, and, and somehow by working together, even though we are just individuals, we kind of limited skills or whatever, we have created these incredible things in the world and built up these amazing machines that go to the moon, that kind of fly you from Perth to Doha, that, you know, these incredible terminals, the city of London, all of these things that we have made. It's just kind of enormous. And on the one level, it's kind of fabulous and amazing and fantastic uh, what we have kind of created in this world. Uh, we have lots of problems as well, but we have, it's, you know, it's, it's also kind of remarkable. Uh, and uh, then when I, when I thought about that, I realized, yeah, but we, even though we have created so much, uh, well, first of all, why have we created all of these things? Uh, and I think the answer is in the search for an end of suffering. Uh, yeah. Uh, that's kind of the reason. We want to find happiness somehow in our pursuit of happiness, in our pursuit of finding an end to all the problems in life. We have created all of these things. You have to make things more convenient and more easy and all of these kind of things. And uh, of course, we don't succeed. Yeah, <laughs> We've done all of these things for thousands of years trying to make an end of suffering. Yeah? And uh, it is still pretty much the same. Yeah, maybe it's worse. I don't know. What do you think? I think sometimes it's worse. Yeah, modern life is not kind of really a very peaceful and happy existence. Uh, and so uh, we. Uh, and so it's kind of strange. Yeah, we do all of this thing, all the activity we do in the world uh, is this search for an end of suffering, a search to find some meaning, a search for contentment, uh, a search for coming to some kind of conclusion. Uh, and we don't get there. Why? Because we're looking in the wrong place. Uh, yeah, searching in the wrong place. Uh, doing something that actually cannot deliver the goods. Uh, and that is kind of the, what is at stake. Yeah. 
And uh, so th this is kind of the thing, and I, one of the things that I am um, kind of enjoy, one of the things that uh, uh, Ajahn Shah, does any, everyone know who Ajahn Shah was? Yeah, everyone, okay. Anyone does not know who Ajahn Shah was? Wow, okay, everyone knows, okay, good, that's probably, there's probably a reason for that. But <laughs> so Ajahn Shah, very, very famous monk, right? Maybe the most famous meditation master in Thailand in the 20th century. Yeah. And of course, the teacher of Ajahn Brahm, my teacher and teacher of many other, many other kind of Westerners uh, here in the UK, Amravati Monastery and elsewhere. Yeah. And he said, uh, yeah, and he said very interesting, he said, this, everything teaches you. Uh, that was kind of one of his sayings. Uh, and, uh, and I think that is kind of what this comes back to. You travel in the world, you see things, and if you are observant, if you know what's going on, uh, there's this feeling that everything teaches you. Uh, and the reason why everything teaches you is because what you see, if you are observant, uh, you see the three characteristics of existence. Uh, yeah, the, the tilakana. Yeah, very kind of important part of this Buddha's teaching that everything in the world, all phenomena in the world, uh, are somehow, uh, I think it's a Bhikkhu Bodhi's uh, expression, stamped by the three characteristics of existence. Uh, yeah, this is kind of their nature. Yeah? And it's everywhere. So this impermanence, suffering and non-self, yeah, anicca, dukkha, anatta, uh, the three characteristics. Uh, and so because that is everywhere, uh, and you look carefully, uh, you will see it everywhere. That is kind of the, the idea here. And so this is also true, and this is kind of why the talk today is interesting. Yeah, There's no such thing as a bad meditation. First time you hear this, you think it's some kind of dodgy marketing. Yeah, It's true, isn't it? What do you mean it's not? Everyone knows there's lots of bad meditations. So what are you talking about? And please pay $1,000 for this retreat. There's no such thing as a bad meditation. Wait. <laughs> This doesn't sound quite right. And uh, so, but you know, and this is kind of this angle again, this angle of everything teaches you. So if you use your meditations, yeah, whether you call them bad or good or whatever you call them, if you use them in the way by you look at them from this vantage point, then of course they can become useful. Yeah, even the most kind of terrible meditation, you're just restless, you're just falling asleep, you're kind of thinking terrible, all fantasies, you're having violent thoughts, I don't know, you know, all the things that happens in meditation sometimes. Um, all of this can be turned around and used in a positive way here. Because uh, I think, uh, and, and then we kind of are on the right track. And this is kind of the idea behind this sort of way of thinking about things. Uh, so, um, uh, first of all, what did the Buddha say here? Uh, it's always important, useful to come back to the Sutta. I think very important to come back to the Sutta. So, what did the Buddha have to say about this? Uh, did he say there is no such thing as a bad meditation? Actually, he did not. Uh, he, said, he said there is such a thing as bad meditation. Uh, so maybe we're on the wrong track. Uh, I don't know. If the Buddha says there is, maybe we have a problem. I'm not sure about that. Uh, but this is in a sutta in the Majjhima called the Gopaka Moggallana Sutta. Uh, Gopaka is like a uh, cow herd or something like that, I think it is. Uh, I'm not sure now exactly what it is. Gopaka. Go is cow. Paka here. What does it mean in this case? Uh, cow herd probably, something like that. Uh, and uh, the cow herd Moggallana. This is a different Moggallana from the Maha Moggallana. Yeah, the Buddha's. Uh, left hand, uh, kind of the right hand, the the left hand is Maha Moggallana, uh, different Moggallana. Uh, and uh, so he has this conversation with the uh, Venerable Ananda. Uh, and this is very soon after the Buddha has passed away. Uh, and uh, so he says to Venerable Ananda, I met to the Buddha in such and such a place. I think he is the one, maybe someone else said it. Uh, I'm not sure, now the details are a bit hazy to me. Uh, but Gopaka Moggana was, uh, was part of this conversation. Uh, I think maybe Vasakara was the one who said this. Uh, anyway, so uh, he says to Ananda, you know, uh, I, you know, the Buddha always praised meditation uh, because he met the Buddha in Rajaga, in the capital of Magadha. Uh, and uh, then uh, Ananda say, no, don't say that. The Buddha did not praise all kinds of meditation. Uh, and then he asked, well, okay, well, so what's the deal? What kind of meditation did he not praise or what's, what's going on there? And Ananda says that the meditation we mind is full of the five hindrances, he did not praise. But the four jhanas, he did praise. 
So that is the answer to the question, what kind of meditation, you know, is kind of bad meditation, if you like, or did not praise her, and the meditation that the Buddha did praise her. So you want to attain the jhana, the samadhi. The samadhi is praised by the Buddha, and hindrances were not praised by the Buddha. Huh? Yeah, I guess we could have guessed that already. It's kind of the suttas are full of the hindrances of the jhana, so we could have sort of, uh, um, you know, that's kind of obvious in a certain way here. Huh? But uh, that is a little bit problematic for most people, right? If the jhanas are the only kind of good meditation, most people would say, but what does that mean for me? Because <laughs> it means I have a problem. Because very often, our meditation, there will be some degree of hindrances in that meditation. Yeah, this is part for the course. This is to be expected. I will give you a, a nice example that just comes to mind just now as I'm talking about this. This is a, and this is kind of very, to my mind, really encouraging. Yeah, yeah? and this is the um, understanding that the Buddha to be, yeah? in other words, before his awakening, yeah? what his life was like, yeah? and what you find, of course, with the Buddha to be. And I always find this very encouraging and very nice is that the Buddha to be was an ordinary human being. Yeah? He was pretty much like us. Yeah? The more you know about the Buddha, the, you know about the, uh, the kind of views he had before his awakening, the sort of defilements he had, the attachments to his family, all of these kind of things, uh, you start to realize that the Buddha actually, in many ways, is, he, he, of course he was human, it's kind of obvious, uh, but this brings out the humanity in the Buddha to be here, uh, when you see all of these things. Uh, and one of the um, things that always stood out to me that was very, very powerful is what you find in the uh, Upakilesa Sutta, the uh, Sutta on the Corruptions, uh, Majjhima Manikaya 128. Uh, and this is a beautiful, beautiful sutta. It's about, the, uh, about meditation, how to achieve the jhanas. Yeah, so we're kind of in the jhana uh, since we're talking about that. Uh, um, and this is where the, uh, the Buddha uh, visits uh, three of his kind of ideal disciples. Uh, and these three others are Anuruddha, Kimbala, and Nandiya. And they are practicing in this park called the Eastern Park, the Pubbarama, I think it is called. Uh, no, it's not called that, it's called something else. Uh, anyway, um, and they're practicing there. And uh, so the Buddha goes to see them. And then he asks them all of these kind of really nice questions. And the question, one of the questions he asks them uh, is, uh, are you living in harmony together? Uh, yeah, and they say, they say yes, living in harmony. Well, how do you do that? Uh, and he says something to the effect that, oh, I think that, uh, you know, how fortunate I am, how incredibly fortunate I am uh, to have companions such as these in the spiritual life. Uh, that's how we live in harmony together. Uh, and then, based on that idea of harmony, and then, of course, it has a few of the kind of typical tropes of the suttas, you know, you blend like milk and water and you see each other with kindly eyes, that's kind of part of that. Uh, but there's this idea, this thought, yeah, I, how fortunate I am, how incredibly fortunate I am uh, to be having companions such as these in the spiritual life. Uh, it's just such a beautiful way of thinking. Uh, and it's such rare, in, so rare in humanity to think about each other in this way. Uh, yeah. But, and of course, then from that, uh, then it goes from that straight into the meditation. After asking that question, uh, the Buddha asks them, well, have you achieved any superhuman states? Yeah. In other words, jhanas and and, uh, you know, the Aryan states, the, you know, all the way to Arahant, all the way to full awakening. Yeah? And he says, yes, so th that is really the foundation yeah, for becoming this super-duper meditator. Yeah? This is Venerable Anuruddha, the greatest meditator uh, among the Buddha's disciples in the Divine Eye. He's kind of listed as one of his main disciples, of Agga Savaka, the peak disciples. Uh, why? Because of the Divine Eye. So he's kind of one of the star disciples of the Buddha, right? Uh, this is how to practice. Just be, see each other with kindly eyes. Um, how fortunate I am, how, for, how incredibly fortunate I am to be able to have companions such as these. This is the foundation for all of that success in meditation later on. That's all you have to do. Yeah, that's really what it comes down to because this is really, of course, an expression of loving kindness, an expression of compassion. Yeah, and if you have that loving kindness and compassion to that extent, uh, it means that all the rest of the morality, the sila, all the other things will fall into place as a consequence. Uh. So this is what you have to do. Uh. Are you up for that? Uh? <laughs> yeah, simple but profound at the same time. The Dhamma is actually very simple. Uh. The things that we have to do are so kind of down to earth. Uh. It's just a matter of doing it. Uh. 
And when we have that appreciation for each other, yeah, I mean, it's not that, it's not that hard. I'm not going to try to say that I'm perfect and I always get this right, but it is not that difficult to do that. You know, when you are in an assembly like this, uh, or any kind of assembly where people come together, uh, uh, or you go on a retreat where people voluntarily keep the eight precepts. Isn't that amazing? Voluntarily, no eating in the afternoon, right? Isn't that kind of extraordinary? If people have that kind of commitment to the spiritual path, then it really is amazing to have spiritual companions such as these. Uh, it's remarkable. People are really trying it. Okay, they're not perfect. Uh, yeah, it's hard to find perfect people in this world, but they're trying incredibly hard. Uh, they have the right intention. Uh, they want to do the right thing. Uh, and that is worthy of so much respect and so much uh, uh, veneration, in a sense, that you can have these kind of thoughts for them. Uh, but that wasn't really what I was going to get to. What I was going to get to uh, was the idea that then the Buddha then asked them, uh, well, based on this idea of harmony, uh, of seeing each other in this way, uh, have you achieved any uttari manusadamas, uh, superhuman qualities, uh, you know, the qualities of noble ones and the qualities of deep meditation? Uh, have you achieved any alangarya nanadasana visesa? Uh, the uh, distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones. Uh, beautiful words, yeah, distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones. Uh, that's Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation of that uh, phrase. Uttari uh, Manusadama, superhuman qualities. Uh, and the Pasu Vihara, Pasu Vihara means like comfortable abiding, a comfortable meditation. Uh, have you achieved any of these things? Uh, and then uh, Anuruddha, Venerable Anuruddha says to the Buddha, he says, well, Sometimes we see lights and we see forms. Yeah, lights, ubasa, forms, rupa. Do you enjoy a bit of Pali words? Is that okay? Am I allowed to say Pali words? Yeah, okay. Thank you. Otherwise, I'd be in deep, deep trouble, I think. <laughs> so he sees lights and forms, yeah, rupa and ubasa. And uh, first of all, what are these lights and forms? Well, actually, yeah, well, they are basically what you can expect, what we often these days talk about as nimittas, samadhi nimittas, yeah, lights in the mind that arise when meditation becomes very deep, yeah, when the world starts to fade away and all that is left is really the mind, the light in the mind. This is kind of what is uh, this obasa and rupa. So there are, you know, when someone like Ajahn Brahm talks about uh, samadhi nimittas, uh, that is, and many other people as well, that is what is uh, how they are talked about in the suttas. Uh, and he says, uh, yeah, we have this experience of light and forms, uh, but before long, uh, they fade away. Uh, yeah, and we haven't discovered the cause for why they fade away. Uh. So that's kind of interesting. Yeah, I, I don't know when I teach meditation, which is always quite a few people who kind of get this samadhi uh, nimitas. Uh, yeah, and what happens to them? They fade away. Uh. They say, oh, we don't know what to do. It fades away. Uh. And it says, you are in very good company. Anuruddha had the same problem, yeah? 2,500 years ago. No wonder it fades away for you. You shouldn't be despairing. You should be super duper happy that you're getting these kind of things happening already, yeah? Well done. Marvelous. Yeah, so this is, <laughs> this is kind of what this, uh, this is kind of amazing how sometimes I think we don't really appreciate kind of the profundity of this path and how profound all of these things really are. And even the most gifted of the Buddha's disciples uh, were having a hard time getting stabilized in these nimittas uh, and getting into the jhanas. Uh, so if you don't get the jhanas kind of on a daily basis, yeah, uh, it is not entirely strange. It is to be expected, in fact. Uh, yeah, these things are super profound. Uh, and so they were having problems getting these things, and then they had to investigate. The Buddha says you should investigate uh, the causes for why they fade away. Yeah, this is what it says. Uh, and uh, then the Buddha says, because I too had that thing happen to me. Yeah? I got the lights, I got the forms, and then they faded. The Buddha to be, the greatest spiritual genius, the greatest spiritual master in human recorded history. He had problems, the same problem as we have today. Isn't that kind of extraordinary? And uh, what that means, of course, is that uh, when we uh, think about meditation, first of all, we should not think that we are inferior to the people at the time of the Buddha. Uh, we are not. We are just exactly in the same boat. Uh, and uh, we, should be, we should be kind of a bit humble about our meditation, understand that actually these things are incredibly profound. Uh, 
And uh, if we don't get the jhanas, even if you don't get the nimittas, even if you get a little bit of happiness and peace in your meditation, it means you're already doing fine there and already doing very well there. And so this is uh, 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 the problem. Yeah? This is why when we see, like in the Gop uh, Gopaka Mogalana Sutta, it talks about this uh, distinction between jhanas on the one hand uh, and the five hindrances on the other. It gives us something to aim for, right? but it sets the bar incredibly high. Yeah, you're not going to clear that bar very... Uh, it may take some time before you clear that bar, huh? but uh, it gives a, an idea where we want to go eventually. That's the idea with that sort of thing. Yeah. So um, that shows us that we're going to have to uh, then deal with these hindrances then. Yeah? This is kind of the standard thing that we have to deal with uh, in the suttas. Uh, and uh, I... Before I talk more about dealing with some of these problems, uh, or um, I, I want to first of all to say that uh, sometimes meditation is really bad, like really, really bad. Yeah, and I know people in the world who have uh, uh, who really don't like meditation at all, uh, who have uh, you know haven't haven't found a way to enjoy it. They have been told that you shouldn't do mindfulness, they're diligent to do mindfulness, uh, but actually they find it terrible. Huh? It's really bad for them. They kind of they, ah, don't want to do it, but you know you're supposed to do it, so I do it anyway, even though I don't like it uh, or whatever. Uh, and that can become very very problematic. So it is important to be honest about the meditation, uh, and it's important to. Uh, take charge of your own meditation, yeah? not to expect others to kind of figure out, not to follow blindly the idea that mindfulness is always going to be good for you, uh, but actually to try to uh, see for yourself what works and what doesn't work. Yeah? And if you're really having lots of problems, uh, then sometimes you just have to uh, put more time and effort into the foundations first of all, and then maybe come back to meditation again later. Yeah? And that's all right. I mean, it's important to remember that this is an eightfold path. Uh, it's not a one-fold mindfulness path, as it seems to be kind of very popular in the modern era. Uh, yeah, don't fall for that trap. Uh, it has an eightfold path, uh, and it starts with many other factors before you come to mindfulness. Uh, so uh, this is one thing. Yeah, be careful. Uh, be gentle with yourself. Uh, meditation, all spiritual practice, uh, is supposed to be beneficial. Uh, yeah, it's supposed to add something to your life. If it uh, subtracts from your life and it makes life more miserable, uh, yeah, we have enough dukkha already. Uh, is that right? Uh, anyone who has not had enough dukkha? <laughs> yeah, most people have enough problems already. They don't need to add another kind of problem. Uh, because uh, so, uh, it can so easily be done by, through meditations. A lot of people have a lot of problems in meditation, so especially long sits and these kind of things, and dukkha of all various kinds. I was actually in Bangkok quite recently. Uh, I was in Bangkok, when is that, a couple of weeks ago? Uh, two, two and a half weeks ago, three weeks ago, whatever it is, uh, I lose track of what... what but, and uh, I was there for doing as a translation workshop. Uh, yeah? So we're kind of all kind of translators from around the world coming. Some very well-known translators here from the uh, UK as well. There's uh, one, uh, Alexander Wynne was there. Uh, who, you probably know him, Adam. You, you, yeah, so he's kind of in the translation circles. Uh, and uh, so a lot of people from Europeans and from North America and people from around Asia are all kind of coming together. And I, I was there as well. Uh, um, so, uh, and what was interesting, one of the leaders of this thing, he's a, he's a Burmese monk. And he, he happens to be the rector of one of the large universities in, uh, in Burma, in Myanmar, called the, the Shan State Buddhist University. Uh, and uh, very nice monk, yeah. very, very pleasant, uh, very gifted. He used to stay in Oxford, by the way. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Venerable Damasami. Uh, uh, and he, so he was in Oxford. He did a PhD in Oxford under Richard Gombrich, uh, who used to be the, uh, one of the professors at Oxford in Sanskrit uh, uh, back in the days. Uh, uh, not, not that long ago, but uh, a couple of like 10 years ago, 15 years ago, something like that. Uh, and so he was there, and so we, we talked a bit. He's quite a senior monk, he's got, been a monk for 40 years, and he's the rector of a big university, so, you know, you, there's, I, I like to be able to say what I want to say, but sometimes, you know, when you in these kind of situations, there's limits to what you can say. But so he was uh, telling me that, actually, I'm not so busy, huh? which I thought, amazing, you are the rector of this university, and you come to these translation conferences or whatever, and you're not so busy, okay, and remarkable. I, I thought that's really a good sign. Huh? And so I said, because of that, over the last few years, I've been doing all these meditation retreats, yeah, because I had this spare time in between. Huh? 
And he has says, and so I asked him, well, what kind of retreats do you do? Who is your teacher? And he said, oh, I have this teacher you have never heard of before. And I said, what is his name? And he came up with this name that I have absolutely no idea who this is. Burma is full of these mysterious teachers that no one has ever heard of outside of Burma. And so then he described, he told me, well, how he does this meditation. And he says that, well, this meditation is mindfulness of breathing. And he said, we breathe like this, he said. <laughs> and then he had, it, he had it on tape, he had recorded it, so I got to hear it, yeah? It sounded absolutely nuts, completely crazy. And it went on like that for like an hour, and he said, well, after an hour, it becomes incredibly painful. And I said, well, what do you do? Well, then you just carry on, he said. Yeah, you keep on going. Yeah. <laughs> and then you do this for nine days, right? And I thought, what? And I wanted to tell him, haven't you read the first sutta of the Buddha, the Dhammachaka Pavatthana Sutta, about the middle way? <laughs> That's what I wanted to do. I couldn't say that because I, he was kind of too senior and too kind of, you sometimes you just have to shut up, you know. I, but uh, that's what I wanted to tell him, this, this kind of very senior monk. Yeah. And so to me, this is, uh, to me, this is interesting. And maybe some people can get something out of that kind of meditation. If you have very strong mindfulness or you have uh, already very, you know, you've gone a long, long way on the path. Uh, but for the majority of people, these kind of uh, exercises, uh, this way of meditating, which I wouldn't even call mindfulness or breathing, to be honest, uh, uh, are, you know, actually going to be very, very problematic and very difficult. Uh, I remember when I uh, first came to Bodhinyana Monastery, or I think even just before I got there, this was back in 1994, uh, uh, there was a monk there who said he hated the breath. Yeah, he was a monk. He had been a monk for many years already, and he hated the breath. And I thought, what? <laughs> One of the points about uh, you know the breath is the breath is supposed to be your friend. Yeah, the breath is to be something that keeps gives you delight, gives you peace, gives you all these beautiful things. So if you hate the breath, well, you have a very serious problem in monastic life. And sure enough, he lasted only a short time after that, and he was gone. He was not, never to be seen again, uh, because uh, it was just unsustainable. Uh, and so these are some of the problems that everyone has in meditation, yeah? These uh, issues that you just, uh, uh, you get it wrong somehow. You kind of approach the idea of meditation completely wrongly, and then you end up with these kind of things. Uh, and then, of course, you have to take a step back. Uh, and you have to ask yourself, how can I avoid hating the breath? Uh, how can I befriend, befriend the breath? I can befriend my fellow Buddhists. Uh, surely I can also uh, befriend my uh, breath at the same time as well. Uh, and that is such an important foundation for this kind of whole idea of the path. Uh, so once we um, come to that point, uh, well, the next thing that we need to ask, yeah, first of all, kind of avoid the kind of really bad pitfalls on the path, uh, learn from those, uh, change tack, uh, go back to the foundations, come back to the basic things again, uh, and then, you know, when time is ready, then come back to the breath. When your mind is ready, you are in a good mood or, you know, you have done the basic developments. Uh. But then uh, uh, there are all the more kind of prosaic and ordinary uh, problems that we have in meditation, yeah. Uh, the five hindrances and all of these kind of things. Uh, yeah, then when you fall asleep and you, you know, your mind is all over the place and you, all of the things that everyone knows about who, been, who has done a bit of meditation in their life. Uh, and then the question is, well, how do we deal with those things? Uh, how do we use these things in a way to actually enhance the practice? Uh, and uh, one of the ways uh, of doing this uh, is uh, just what I did just before. You may have noticed, uh, yeah, this was kind of also like an introduction to the talk. In fact, I do this thing every time now when I uh, guide meditation, also try to do it in my own practice. Uh, and that is the idea of asking yourself uh, at the end of the meditation, what, how was that? Uh, what happened? Uh, did it work? What did not work? Why did it work? What are the causes yeah, that make meditation peaceful? What are the causes that give rise to good perceptions in meditation, perceptions that uh, actually enhance the experience of meditation? Huh? And uh, if you get into that habit uh, yeah, of actually looking at the meditation, trying to understand how it works in this way, huh, after a while you start to uncover the secrets of meditation. Huh? And of course, those secrets, it turns out, are incredibly simple. Yeah, this is, of course, meditation is a very simple thing. It's about sitting on your bottom and watching the breath. It couldn't get much more simple than that. Yeah, 
And still somehow we kind of mess it up. And the reason we mess it up is because we are so complicated uh, as, as human beings. Uh, and so what you start to understand as you look at that, you start to uncover these very, very basic ideas. Uh, and one of the basic ideas that you uncover is the, uh, what it means to let go. Uh, yeah, what is actually letting go? Uh, and uh, you may have, you know, I, I don't know about, about you, but a lot of people, they try to let go, right? Uh, we try letting go. And of course, the trying itself is very often the opposite of letting go. The trying is just more doing, uh, yeah, more activity. Uh, so it's the opposite of actually what we're trying to get, get to. Uh, and then one day you see that actually uh, today my meditation was quite nice. Uh, why was it nice? Well, because I let go more than usual. Uh, what was that letting go? Actually, it was nothing. I was just relaxing. That was really all it was. Yeah, I forgot to relax before. That was the problem. And it really is often as simple as that. And that is why, you know, sometimes when it comes to meditation practice, sometimes you need some very simple ideas to kind of teach you what it actually means to relax. Not trying to relax, but actually really doing the relaxing. And then as you allow your body and mind to relax, through that ability to relax, often mindfulness will arise through that. There's a bit more to it than that. That is kind of the beginning point. And that's why I like the idea of the armchair. Armchair. <laughs> I guess this, is very, this is very good, isn't it? Fortuitous that we actually have an armchair. So this kind of, kind of makes the point. I like the idea of the armchair because, you know, you come back after a long day's work and then you kind of sit down in your favorite armchair. I think Venerable Anand is going to be my favorite armchair from now on, <laughs> at least when I come to London. So, um, um, yeah, when you come home from a long day's work and you're really tired, sometimes you just want to sit down. You just want to relax. And when you sit down and relax after a long day's work, what do you do? In that armchair, do you try to relax really hard? Okay, relax, relax, relax. No, that's the last thing you do, right? You, just, you kind of zonk out and you kind of allow everything to kind of move and you allow your mind to kind of do whatever your mind wants to do. That's what you do when you come back after a long day's work. That is what it means to relax, not doing anything, allowing the mind just to unfold, to do its thing. That is what it means to relax. And so the same thing in meditation, yeah. Stop even to think about it as meditation practice. Uh, the moment you use the word meditation, you think, okay, I've got to do this, I've got to do that, I've got to watch the breath. Don't worry about the breath, yeah? Forget about the breath. Uh, because if you go to the breath when you're not ready, uh, it's going to have all kinds of negative consequences of holding on, grasping, and all of these kind of things. Uh, so instead, uh, start out by just relaxing like that. Uh, yeah, allowing the mind to be here, yeah. not bullying the mind. Yeah, we always bully the mind. Do this, do that. Don't think this, think that. Oh, poor mind. Yeah. <laughs> so we allow the mind to be. And then as the mind is allowed to be, you're taking all the doing out of it. Then things calm down beautifully by themselves. This is what it means to learn from the meditation experience. Yeah, this is kind of one of those really important points. And then you will see that the less you do in the meditation, the less you're able, the more you're able to relax to this. Yeah, you start to understand how the process happens. And the second thing that you learn in meditation very quickly, you learn the idea of being patient. Yeah, you learn the idea of not looking forward to where you want to go, not actually trying to achieve anything, but just enjoying whatever you have right now. Yeah, every time you look forward, that will comes back in there again. It makes everything uncomfortable. You can't really relax anymore. And so you learn quite quickly, actually patience. No, forget about the future. Forget about those jhanas. Don't worry about the jhanas. Don't worry about the nimittas. Don't worry about anything. Yeah, just sit back and enjoy what you have. This is good enough. So patience is the second thing that you learn very, very quickly when you see this. You see when you go wrong, actually, yes, okay, I went wrong. Okay, more patience next time. You follow this idea of the Buddha in the Upakalesa Sutta, in the Sutta on the corruptions I just was talking about before, where they were having problems with keeping the nimittas. Follow the same procedure. What is the cause? What is the reason why things aren't stabilized? Why is our meditation working today? Why was it not working yesterday? What is going on? This is kind of this aspect of understanding the meditation process. So patience, 
and letting go, yeah? Two of the really fundamental things of meditation. Letting go, of course, only starts with the idea of relaxing. Yeah? It goes much beyond that. Uh, and I will talk more about that uh, uh, shortly. Yeah? That's kind of the plan anyway, see what, what happens. Uh, talk more about that shortly. Yeah? Uh, the letting go of more, the interest in the world, is a deeper kind of letting go, right? Uh, and that letting go of the interest in the world uh, is actually ultimately what allows the mind to be peaceful. In other words, letting go of the interest in the world means ha having, getting your priorities right. Uh, yeah, getting prioritizing the spiritual path, uh, prioritizing the peace, uh, not prioritizing the world. That's really what it kind of comes down to. Uh. So I'll get back to that, to that in a second. But one way of doing that, actually, yeah, when we're doing that is this idea of just seeing the world, seeing everyone struggling, everyone working really hard, everyone building A380s, building massive terminals in, in the middle of the desert in Qatar, yeah, uh, seeing everyone working so hard to make this world work and not really getting out of dukkha that way. Yeah, that is one of those learning experiences that we can use that helps you to let go of the world. Because if we do all these things, it doesn't get us anywhere, well, maybe there is an alternative way. Where is that way? Sitting on your bottom, watching the breath. Yeah? Why are we building all of these things when you can just sit on your bottom? It's kind of crazy, isn't it? It's much more, much more nice to sit sitting here doing nothing in my favorite armchair here. <laughs> so that, that is one thing that you learn very quickly. The other thing that you learn very quickly uh, is the importance of enjoying the meditation. Yeah? You learn very quickly that there are certain ways, uh, if you perceive in a certain way, if you use your mind in a certain way, especially at the beginning of the meditation, but also as you're going through the process, uh, it becomes enjoyable. Uh, yeah, so this is one of those things that we have to learn. So at the, then you start to understand that well, actually at the beginning of meditation, if you're having some, if you're upset about something, yeah, don't dwell on that upset. Let me first of all sort that out before I really start to meditate at all. Okay, this person that did this, why did they do that? They did it against me, 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 me. Wow, that's terrible. You know, they did it against the other person, doesn't matter. They did it against me, then it's really bad. So. <laughs> Yeah, so we learn how to deal with these kind of things. Very simple ideas, such as just having compassion, understanding the nature of human beings, understanding how everyone is trapped in their conditioning. Yeah? And as you do that, you can actually, okay, let go. They don't know what they're doing anyway. Who cares if they did this? Yeah, they are, it's just their conditioning or, or, or whatever. Yeah? And then you kind of overcome these things. Yeah? So you learn these beautiful ways of uh, putting your mind in the right spot, uh, before or and also sometimes during the meditation. Uh, yeah, you do some of these beautiful little things that the Buddha talks about in the suttas. Uh, one of them is the Kalyana Mitta Anusati. Uh, anusati is recollection. And the Buddha talks about all of these kind of recollections, uh, yeah, which are all very, very useful. Uh, but one of them you don't hear about so often, which I think is also very nice, is the Kalyana Mitta Anusati, the recollection of your good spiritual friends. Uh, yeah? And uh, very powerful, that was exactly what Anuruddha did, going back to the Upakalesa Sutta again, I talked about before. He was saying, oh, how wonderful it is to have these spiritual companions. And the same thing with us, yeah, when you are in a hall like this, you can kind of rejoice in the good company, yeah, and yeah? being with good people. Yeah? And so that simple act of rejoicing in the good company, yeah, brings out a positive perception of <coughs> in the mind <coughs> straight away. Mm. Wow, Mara. Um. Go away. <laughs> <clears throat> so that already <clears throat> brings up a nice perception, yeah, right there. Uh, then there are the other anusattis of the Buddha. There is the idea of uh, gratitude, which is a very important part of Buddhism. All of these little things, yeah, if you have developed these ideas beforehand. Uh, the most powerful one is the Buddha Nusati, the recollection of the Buddha, because the Buddha start, it starts with the Buddha, and all of these other recollections are really, they come from the Buddha. So if you can have this idea of having the Buddha as your teacher, and think how amazing that is to have the Buddha as your teacher, yeah, if you can make that into an emotional thing, wow, you're gonna, you have a, something very powerful inside of you to kind of drive the meditation, if that's possible. It's not so easy to do, and, uh, but it is a very powerful thing here. And so you look into these uh, 
uh, the way that the mind works or the mind doesn't work. And as you do that, you start to unravel this whole thing. Then every meditation becomes, uh, what was, it, was the title again? There's no such thing as a bad meditation, right? Every meditation becomes useful. Every meditation becomes grist for the mill. Every meditation becomes something you can use for the way forward. And as you do that, then you can get into the real good meditation that the Buddha was talking about eventually. Yeah, the nimittas, the stillnesses, the real samadhis that are really the purpose or the kind of initial purpose of this path. So uh, that is how to use yeah, these things to make uh, the uh, uh, bad meditations into good meditation. There's no such thing as a bad meditation. Uh, but um, I wanted to talk a little bit about also about, um, I mentioned initially that uh, there are, there's more to letting go than just relaxing. Uh, and a very important part of the letting go is how we relate to the world uh, and how we pr prioritize the spiritual life uh, or the spiritual right here and now when we sit here compared to the worldly things. Uh, yeah, you will have noticed the importance of that. Uh, you sit there in meditation and then you think about, uh, well, what do you think about? Uh, your job maybe, uh, your family, uh, your house, uh, yeah, something in the world that bothers you, yeah, whatever it might be, you've got to solve a problem, right? Uh, meditation time is really good time for solving problems. Uh. <laughs> yeah, nothing else to do, okay, now is the time to solve problems. Uh, and what, uh, and, and what, is, uh, what is interesting, of course, is if you have a bit of success in a meditation, you become more peaceful, actually the mind becomes more powerful. So you actually have more ability to solve problems. So, yeah, this is kind of the uh, where you have to be really careful. Uh. And so to avoid this idea of the mind always going into the worldly things, uh, yeah, thinking about whatever it is in the world, uh, oh no, the war in Ukraine, oh, this disaster, family problems, issues at work, whatever it might be. Uh, to avoid that, uh, we have to have a kind of the right attitude uh, towards the world and the right attitude towards the spiritual path. Uh, and that right attitude will help you to renounce your interest in the world. Uh, now this takes time, yeah, this is kind of profound. You have to contemplate these things over a long period of time for these things really to work. Yeah, these are, these are uh, uh, profound tendencies of the mind, that the mind likes to engage with the world. Yeah, this, is, this has been our habits for eons, for lifetimes, yeah, going back into the deep past. So it is actually very, it takes a long time to turn around that momentum of that super tank here. Yeah. Yeah, the super tanker is the mind, has this incredible momentum. I don't know if you've seen the super tankers, uh, these enormous ships kind of weigh half a million tons. Uh, and sometimes they can, because the engines are so large, they can do like 20 knots or whatever. You can imagine half a million tons moving at 20 knots through the ocean. Uh, that takes a long time to turn around. Uh, yeah, it takes like kilometers, uh, tens of kilometers to turn around. Uh, you know, it's slowly, slowly, slowly. Uh, and our minds, I think they're probably worse than super tankers actually. Uh, because the momentum is so huge from the past. Uh, yeah? It has kind of one direction and very important part of that direction is the interest in the world around us, worldly things, the sensory realm, yeah? all of the things around us. Uh. And so we need to turn that around a little bit. Uh. And uh, so we need then to reflect about the world. Uh. And uh, there's many ways of reflecting about the world. But one of the most important ways is to understand the world as uh, impermanent uh, yeah? and unreliable and uncertain. Uh. And the more you understand the world in that way, uh, the more you will turn away from it. Uh. But before I talk about that, I had a, I was just the other day, uh, I was uh, teaching a retreat actually in Perth. Uh. So this is kind of, <laughs> this is what life is. You, you go from one kind of thing to another one. Uh, and, uh, it's, and it's actually great because as a monk, all you do is nice stuff. Uh, isn't that great? Uh, this is a very good reason to ordain, to become a monk around. All you do is good stuff. Yeah? You either you teach Dhamma or you practice Dhamma. And that's pretty much what your life is about. Uh. There's a few, maybe a few other things as well, but I'm not sure. There's a few other things about uh, <laughs> like uh, administration or whatever. But it's kind of still, it's, it's the best kind of administration. Right? You can be doing administration in some kind of company, okay? At least you do it in the monastery, so it's kind of, that's the good part of it. Uh. And so what occurred to me as I was, I was reading a sutta, I think, yeah, and it's always when you read the word of the Buddha, that's kind of when the kind of little kind of understanding sometimes arises. Uh. 
And it became clear to me that, you know, one of the problems with our life is that we have a tendency to think of time as linear. Yeah, time is linear in the sense that time begins somewhere and it ends somewhere. Christianity is kind of the master of linear time. Yeah, God created the world and then the second coming of Christ is kind of the end of the world. I don't know exactly what the, what the kind of theology is, but something like that. Yeah, the world begins and the world comes to an end. And in the meantime, we're kind of moving somehow, whatever way, to that goal up there somewhere. There's a sense of direction, a sense of purpose, a sense that there actually is some final final end point to this. And if you look at modern cosmology, it's a little bit similar. As a big bang, it's kind of the beginning of everything, and it's kind of the big whimper over here. I think big whimper is kind of, I think, what well, kind of everything just disperses endlessly until there's kind of nothing left. There's just kind of um, nothing going on, happening anymore. And again, it's this idea of beginning and end point. In this case, the end point has no purpose, but it's still, it's like an end point. And so I, and I think also the human ego, also uh, the sense of self, also has a tendency to think like that, yeah, in terms of linear time. In other words, the ego wants purpose, uh, the ego wants happiness, the ego wants meaning. Yeah? And so the ego tends to project that search for meaning onto life and seeing somehow that we are going somewhere, yeah, that our life has meaning. Yeah? Yeah, you know what it's like when you're young? It looks like, you know, you start out, you know, in your teens or you go to university and you kind of have this feeling like, yeah, I go to university, that has a meaning, get good grades, I get a nice job, I get married, I have one and a half kids, you know, three quarters car or whatever it is they have these days, you know. And then it seems kind of meaningful, right? It seems like we're going somewhere here. That's what it seems like. I remember when I was at university, it kind of had a feeling of purpose somehow. And I think the ego creates the same kind of illusion, yeah? And I think that's why many religions have that uh, illusion as well, because very often a religion is often just the uh, kind of manifestation of our inner yearnings, yeah? A manifestation writ large, uh, you know, like, a, like a god also, creator god, is a kind of, a, I think, an external um, projection of our inner sense of self very often. Uh. And so you, you, we have this idea of linear time. I think it's very deep-seated in human beings. Uh, yeah? And that idea of linear time gives you a feeling of purpose, uh, that we're going somewhere. Uh, and because of that, things in the world become kind of interesting. Uh, yeah? Because they become kind of, wh where are we going with this? Uh, we are going towards something. Uh, yeah? Okay, the war in Ukraine. Yeah, what does it mean? Uh, yeah? uh, what, what, how, how is it developing? That's really exciting. It's developing this way or that way. Yeah? Who's going to win? Who's going to lose? Is it going to be a better world afterwards or a worse world afterwards? Uh, what's happening in the Middle East with the wars down there? What's happening with climate change, uh, the latest on climate change? What's happening with artificial intelligence, right? Uh, is it going to be good or bad? How can we harness it for good? And so you have all of these things in the world, and we, all of these things, we tend to see them in this idea, through this uh, prism of linear time, yeah, that we are going somewhere. That are, and that, that is why all of these things become really interesting, yeah, because the sense of purpose in all of these things, uh, that we're actually heading somewhere. Yeah. If you look at uh, historians, for example, very often they will kind of like to show us how the world is always becoming better. Yeah? And this idea that the world is always becoming better, again, is this idea of linear time, that we are actually heading somewhere here. Yeah? But all of that is wrong, according to Buddhism. Yeah, it's wrong. There is no linear time. Circular time is what there actually is. The idea is that things really tend to come back to the beginning again. They go round and round, not exactly the same beginning, but roughly the same beginning. Yeah. This is the idea when you look sometimes at the problems in your life, you wonder, are they ever going to end? Yeah, it's the same things kind of recurring. Yeah, yeah you, you kind of same thing happening again and again and again very often. Yeah. Then that happens then into multiple lifetimes. Yeah, you go back to the beginning again, back to kindergarten. Yeah. Wait, back to kindergarten? I didn't, can't, I didn't really want to go back to kindergarten again. I didn't have that whole process of schooling in front of you and arguing with your parents and then, you know, all of these kind of things. <laughs> and uh, then really writ large, of course, is the whole universe going through cycles, right? Uh, the Buddhism talks about many eons of universes. Uh, and so the universe contracts and expands. And this is kind of, I think, that is what... Uh, there are some words in the sutta that talk about this, loke sangvatati and loke vivatati. And um, vivatati, 
it's, this is actually quite interesting. What the word what you know in in English you have the word evolve, right? Volve is a, uh, is a, the root of that word means to roll. Yeah, you know, like the word Volvo. Volvo means to roll, right? And so you have the Volvo means to roll, and vatta vatta in Pali also means to roll. And then you have the prefix e, evolve, means like you know, evolution. V in Pali, but it is the same, similar kind of prefix, means kind of evolution, yeah, rolling out, yeah, the rolling out of things. The universe kind of rolls out, metaphorically speaking. Yeah. And then you have the Sangvatati kind of coming together, yeah, the kind of opposite of evolution. In involution, I'm not sure what that becomes in English, but anyway, whatever, whatever that is, we have to coin a new word for that one, I think. Yeah. And so, so same ideas, I think that quite clearly corresponds to kind of modern cosmology of the Big Bang, but then there's also a, the opposite, the anti-Big Bang, things coming together again, yeah? So things kind of, the universe being in this kind of this cyclical thing here. Yeah? And in that cyclical thing here, yeah, when you see yourself redoing the same things again and again and again, life after life, when you see the universe renewing itself, yeah, coming back again, basic starting out from scratch again, yeah, then that idea that we are going somewhere, yeah, the idea that there is a meaning to this, that we are actually heading towards something, yeah, that is completely shattered. Yeah. Yeah, there is actually no meaning, there is no purpose to the universe. The universe isn't going anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And this is really problematic. It just keeps on going on. We aren't going on anywhere. How many times have we already had this kind of lives? You would probably be horrified if you knew. This is kind of the scary thing with remembering your past lives, seeing what is going on. It's like, wow, that is what is going on. And I think this is exactly why the Buddha to be had to remember his past life before his awakening. He had to get that insight into dukkha, because that's really what it is, insight into dukkha, seeing your past lives. And so from a Buddhist point of view, and this is a, a couple of those, again, really nice translations that I like in the sutta. This is Bhikkhu Bodhi again. Bhikkhu Bodhi is kind of the m most masterful translator of the suttas, in my, my opinion. And he, th these words are sangvat, uh, 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 the, the words are sangsarati. Yeah, sangsarati and sangdavati are the words we find in the suttas. And what the, these verbs mean, they mean like the walking on in sangsara, the moving on in sangsara. Literally means sangsaraing or something like that, yeah, to sangsara. Yeah, you, <laughs> that's what we all do, we, we sangsara. And so, uh, and he translates one of those words as to roam around. Yeah, roaming around. And that is kind of, that is getting much closer to the point than this idea of linear time. Because roaming is this idea of aimlessness. There is no aim, there is no purpose, you're not going anywhere. You're just roaming around the streets of London at night, yeah, whatever it might be, yeah, before the police pick you up. Or, <laughs> <laughs> and so this is the idea of roaming. Yeah? This is kind of what samsara really is about. Yeah? And this is the Buddhist way. And once you start to think of it like that, uh, and you get into that, I mean, obviously you have to have some confidence. And if you, have to, if you don't have confidence, it's not going to work. Yeah? But if you have some confidence in that, it's kind of the world becomes almost, uh, instead of being interesting what's going to happen in Ukraine, actually it's completely uninteresting what's going to happen in Ukraine. All we know is going to be war, the war is going to go on for maybe five for so long or so long or who knows what. Then there's going to be some kind of peace at, at the end of it. And then after the end of the peace, it's going to be more war. After the end of that war, it's going to be more peace. And after that, it's going to be more war. That's all we know. We know it's going to roll on and on and on like this. The actual outcome is kind of irrelevant. Yeah, it, it's not going to go, and there isn't any purpose to it. I mean, the Middle East must be the most classic example of all, not having any purpose to wars, yeah? They have been going on for, I, I don't know how long now. That is, by the way, talking about the Middle East and purposelessness, this was the, uh, uh, the story Ajahn Brahm tells, I don't know if it has, he tells it recently, but Ajahn Brahm has many stories that he has forgotten recently. It means I can tell them instead, right? I, that kind of makes life easier for me. And it's in the, one of his books, Opening Door of Your Heart or whatever, and he, in this uh, book he talks about, there was an interview with Har Harold Macmillan. Uh, remember Harold Macmillan, the Prime Minister of England, UK, back in the 1960s? Uh, very, very, quite a famous Prime Minister, I think. He was, I think he was considered to be, at least sometimes he was a bit wise. Uh, not maybe. <laughs> and he was interviewed by the BBC, and this was, I think, due, just during the Six-Day War in the Middle East, uh, yeah, when there was Israel against all the neighbours. Uh, 1967, I think, was a Six-Day War in the Middle East. Uh, 
And uh, so the war had just started, and he was interviewed by BBC, and his and uh, they said, uh, you know, well, you know, what are we, uh, wh- what are we going to do with the problem in the Middle East? Uh, and Harold Baker says, there is no problem in the Middle East. Uh, and the journalist said, what? What do you mean there's no problem? There's, they're blowing each other up, they're killing each other, you know, they, 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 what do you mean there's no problem? Uh, and he said, well, there is no solution in the Middle East, uh, and so there is no problem. Uh, <laughs> That's brilliant, isn't it? Uh, I, I, I'm sure that maybe there is a solution, but the point is that he couldn't see a solution. Uh, there was no way out of it. Uh, and so why worry about things if there is no solution? Uh, yeah, that is the idea. Uh, and that is exactly how we should think in meditation here. Uh, there is no solution to the problems you're thinking about. Uh. <laughs> yeah, this is exactly the Harold Macmillan problem. Uh. In your meditation, you may think about all of these things in your life, think about all of the things in the world. Uh. Yeah, and so w- w- the problems in your life, the problems at work, okay, maybe you solve one problem. Uh. There's always another problem waiting behind it. Uh. The reason we are still here after all of these lifetimes uh, is precisely because we have been solving problems in our meditation. Uh. And we're still here solving problems in our meditation, yeah? So that is not the way to solve the problem. The way to solve the problem is to become peaceful. The way to solve the problem is to find a way out of this whole, this whole problem that we are in, in a much deeper sense. That is where the real solution exists. And then we are on the right track. And so there's this understanding about the nature of the world, yeah? The world, there is no solution in that world. There's always more problems. That world is inherently unreliable. It is never going to give the solutions that you want. You solve one thing, something else arises, and it goes on and on and on like this, almost forever. And that is a very simple insight. I think we can all agree with that. This is the idea of anicca, of impermanence in Buddhism. It's a very kind of simple idea. Yeah, We all can relate to that in, uh, uh, in some way or another. And then all we have to do is to kind of just expand that basic insight a little bit and start to see the whole world like that. Uh, The whole world is just so utterly unreliable. Uh, The whole world is always shaking. Uh, It's like a low-level earthquake always waiting to kind of take off and become bad, like in Iceland and all the lava comes out, yeah, or whatever it is. Uh, And then you are in serious trouble there. And it's always like that. Uh, There is no stability in that world. uh, And it's far more unstable than we think it is. Uh, One of my favorite little experiments that I heard about recently, the little things... uh, Two more minutes. uh, (laughs) I got got that look which means we are coming to the end. Okay, so thank you. Thank you for reminding me. Well, I I actually appreciate that. It's good to be told. uh, so this, this very this nice ex, uh, piece of research that was done, uh, yeah, and this was, I can't remember exactly where it was done, uh, but it was about people's ability to understand change. Uh, and uh, it asked them, look into the past. Uh, yeah, look into the past 10 years uh, and look upon your life in those 10 years. Uh, can you see how you have changed? Uh, and I said, yes, I can see how I had it before I was like this, before I was not a Buddhist. Uh, then I met Venerable Chanda, I became a Buddhist straight away. I, I knew this was the right path. Uh, or, you know, something like that. Yeah, you can see, and I became a better person, I learned about the five precepts, or maybe sometimes we become a worse person, whatever. We can see change, we can kind of see the lines of our life, yeah, when we look into, uh, look into the past. And then the same people will ask, well, now tell us about the future, yeah, the next 10 years, in 10 years' time, where will you be? And it turns out no one is really able to see change in the future. What you see in the future is just more of the present. You see the present kind of amplified a little bit, yeah? Or you, I'll be slightly better Buddhist. My retreats will be a little bit longer, yeah? Or whatever. That's kind of what you see in the future. But you don't see any radical change. Yeah? And so we, and I think this comes from the feeling, you know, that we are entities, the feeling of a sense of self in, in many ways, uh, that tends to project what we are now into the future. Uh, and so we always underestimate change in the future. Uh, we are never really able to see it properly. Uh, and this is why this reflection is so powerful. Uh, yeah, because it allows you access to that reality which otherwise tends to be blocked from us. Uh, and so you look at the future, remember the uncertainty in everything. Remember there's nothing to hold on to in this world. Remember it's far more uncertain than you want it to be. It is uncertain on the macro level, the world at large, yeah, the, 
the wars and the, the asteroids waiting to hit the earth, right? Uh, it is artificial intelligence. I don't care if artificial intelligence is going to be helpful or bad or destroy the planet. Uh, that is not the point of artificial intelligence. The point of it is it is uncertain, it is unreliable. We have no idea what's going to happen. That's the point of it. Uh, climate change, looking bad, the most important point of climate change is the uncertainty of it, the unreliability of what's going to happen with us. Uh, yeah, That is the main point. Uh, we just don't know what's going to happen. That is the scary part. Uh, then there is the uncertainty in your family. Yeah, the family life. We don't know what's going to happen with the people who are dearest to us. Uh, yeah, this is kind of really scary. Uh, and so you kind of start to see how through and through everything is touched by this thing called impermanence. Uh, and the more deeply you see that, uh, as you contemplate this thing, uh, you start to really let go of the world outside. Uh, you don't think about a meditation anymore, because why think about dukkha? Why think about things that are out of control? Let me instead think about that, those things uh, where the future is really made. Uh, and where the future is really made is on the spiritual path. Uh, this is where we create resilience in this life because we create a powerful inner mind and also where we create a good future in terms of multiple lifetimes or whatever it might be. So focus on where the future is really made and let go of those things that are forever out of control. And then you're going to guide the mind beautifully in meditation and take it in the right direction. Okay, there you are. <laughs> So you want to say sadhu, you can say sadhu now if you like. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. <laughs> so Q&A? Q &A. Yeah. Excellent. It's 20 minutes past nine? So 20 minutes. 20 minutes, uh, 20 minutes you and I, okay. Yeah. It's all silent the first part. Yeah. I have some good news, actually. I have some good news. Yeah, so we, maybe we can discuss the good news. So I was in Sri Lanka recently, and when I was in Sri Lanka, we had a discussion about starting a nuns monastery in Sri Lanka. Did you hear about that? Yeah, so that's kind of interesting, isn't it? So we're looking at starting a nuns monastery affiliated with kind of with Ajahn Brahm and the Buddhist side of Western Australia in Sri Lanka, and that because in Sri Lanka there's a lot of Buddhism going on, but not so much, it's still the facilities for nuns is not very good in Sri Lanka. So it would be nice to establish a really good, nice place where there's kind of good training and there's good understanding is supported by uh, the BSWA, maybe having a bit of exchange so nuns from Sri Lanka can come to Australia and Australian or international nuns can go to uh, Sri Lanka, whatever. Uh, that is the latest, uh, latest order. It's exciting, isn't it? <laughs> Things are happening here. Yeah. So it's going to take a while. Because I'm not still 100% sure it's going to happen because it's still very early days, uh, but uh, it looks like it will happen. It's looking good. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Anyway. Sean, you want to take the... You can, you can, maybe Sean can take the, take the microphone here. Uh, yeah? You want to do it? Uh, okay. Yeah. Maybe if I have to introduce myself, I'm a naughty one because I do try to go everywhere and try to understand what is the best means of exploring meditation. Yeah, so maybe that's the mistake that I'm doing. Uh -huh. But uh, uh -huh. in a way, it's exciting as well for me. So that's the reason why I've been doing it. And the naughty side is also because not being permanent or continuing back to the same thing. So I'm not sure how that relates to linear and circular aspect that you mentioned. Okay, okay. sorry, can you, can you try that again? Uh, I was explaining, and I was saying the naughty part. Yeah, so, okay. I was, okay. So I'm not being regular with yeah. some of the meditation right. things. Okay. So I'm not sure how that relates with linear and being circular, that I join to yeah. some sessions, and then it starts again sort of point. But uh, the, the question that I want to okay. ask, uh -huh is more about, uh, 
you mentioned, for example, that you do a meditation, and then once you are done with it, and you you can reflect on it and say, what was it? How was it? What did it do right and wrong? Uh, for personally, I find it very difficult to do that because I have got no understanding of how would you judge whether it was good, whether it was bad, and okay. where yeah. it is going. All right. Okay. Good. So yeah. it, it's just that question: that yeah. is there any means that we can? Great understand? question. Yeah, excellent question, Sandra. That's a wonderful question. That's a really good question, actually, because it brings things back to uh, uh, you know to the basics of meditations. That's that's marvelous. So uh, the uh, so good meditation, yeah, the purpose of meditation is really twofold, you could say. Yeah. Uh, well, the most important purpose is to calm down the mind, to make the mind peaceful. Yeah? That is really the purpose of meditation. Yeah? Uh, but it's not any kind of peace, it's a kind of peace with clarity. It's not the peace of dullness, but the peace with clarity. Yeah? So, and that clarity can manifest as joy or happiness, for example. So if you have joy, you know that you tend to be clear, because joy tends to bring up clarity of the mind. So peace and joy in the mind, yeah, these are the two kind of two things that you can measure meditation by. And I, I thought I was going to talk a little bit about one of my favorite suttas, the Chetana Karaniya Sutta, uh, which is basically about the psychological development of meditation. Yeah? When you sit down, how it develops when it works right. Uh, and what is very interesting about that sutta is that it talks about two qualities throughout. Not only that sutta, but also the uh, Anapanasati Sutta, mindfulness of breathing. Two qualities you see again and again and again in this sutta. One of them is that you, you enjoy it. There is happiness, rapture, joy. And the other one is it is tran <coughs> tranquil and calm. These are the two things. So these are the measures by which you know the meditation is working. Yeah. So if you come out at the end of the meditation, and the meditation is uh, completely, you know, you are kind of tired, you're falling asleep, or you are more restless than you start, or you, or you get, are angry when you come out of meditation, or whatever it might be, uh, you know, it hasn't delivered on those two things, right? So then there's a problem. Okay, why did it happen? You can ask yourself, what, where did I go wrong? Uh, if it does deliver on those two things, uh, you can also ask yourself, why? How did those two things come about? Yeah? What did I actually do to make that happen? Uh, so that is basically the idea. Does that make sense? Yeah? Yeah? I should also say a little bit maybe about it, because you know, one of the, we often talk about two things in Buddhism, samatha and vipassana. Have you heard those two words? Yeah? Vipassana is kind of used all the time. You go on the vipassana retreat. And, and these are two qualities of mind that should come out of meditation practice. Yeah? And uh, samatha is the karma I was just talking about. And the joy is also often related to that samatha. And vipassana is the clarity of mind. It can be, it's often translated as insight, but I think clear seeing is a better translation actually. So you see things clearly, yeah? If you're calm and you have a feeling of strong awareness, you're like awake, yeah? That is kind of that. And you have the ability to see things better because of that. That is another way of thinking about it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, please, Sean. Yeah. Hello, John. Um, Hi. Yeah, thank you for the talk and uh, obviously thank you for coming over as well. Yeah. So one thing that just occurred to me, which I say I think I understand because I understand the concept, but if you've got maybe if you've got a full understanding means that maybe you're really far ahead, right? But when you were saying, for example, oh, there's a war or there's something going on, but you were saying that's just the way it is, almost yeah. like this acceptance. There's part of me that then thinks, obviously, because I'm very in the world, that, right. well, what, you just, that's yeah, fine, yeah. you shouldn't try and do something to help. So where, right. where's that balance? Yeah, and... yeah. Yeah, no, thank you for, for saying that, because it, it, these things can come out really wrongly if you are too one-sided about this. So thanks for bringing that up. And that is true, not just of war, but it's true of climate change, it's true of artificial intelligence, it's true of any problem that we have. It's about knowing what, is knowing kind of the, the, the balance. Uh, and the, uh, the balance is that, um, you, you know, when there is an, a moral issue in the world, and war is definitely a moral issue, uh, obviously. Climate change is a moral issue. All of these things are moral issues because people will get hurt if you don't do something. Uh, then, we, of course, we should do what we can to kind of gu guide it in the right direction, you know, or whatever that might be from a Buddhist point of view. Uh, 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 and as someone's a very complex, as you don't know what the right direction is, it's kind of too hard to really resolve. Uh, and so you do what you can in all, all these situations. Uh, 
Uh, but then you also realize that you never know the outcome. Huh? Yeah? In the end, it's going to be, comp- in the end, it's uncertain. Huh? You can do your very best with, uh, you know, being a climate change activist and climate change might just still, you know, be just as bad as it was before. It may not have any effect at all because the, we live in a large world and what do you do as one person is going to have only a tiny little effect. Huh? And so we do what we can, but we realize that in the end, we are, it is out of our control. Huh? And so when you sit in meditation, you don't think about something that is ultimately out of control anyway. Yeah, yeah? You don't kind of worry about things that in the long run uh, is going to be, uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's just uncertain what's going to happen here. So you do things, I and mean, when you do things, you do it out of a sense of kindness, a sense of you know, wanting to support others, uh, uh, out of generosity. Uh, and when you do things in that way, uh, they won't reverberate in the mind so much afterwards. I'm doing this simply to be kind to the world. Okay, climate change, I don't want that to happen to everyone because everyone's going to suffer. I don't want that to happen. Or so you do it out of kindness. Uh, and that is that very famous story. Of, uh, this is this book uh, called The Coronavirus. I don't know if you've seen that book, uh, Sean, Coronavirus. It was a book that we put together just at the big... Yeah, Ajahn Brahm book. Yeah, we put it together at the beginning of the uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic. Yeah. And we kind of typed it coronavirus. Yeah, it sounds corona is compassion, right? So compassion virus is kind of a bit more useful than the other, the other variety. Uh, <laughs> and so we put this together and I was charged with kind of coming up with the stories because I know Ajahn, I've been living with Ajahn Brahm for 30 years. I know him quite well. <laughs> I know him many inside stories. <laughs> so, um, um, but one, so one of those stories that I uh, mentioned in that book yeah, was uh, the story of when we had a big fire in our monastery in Perth. Yeah? And, and that's, for me, that was a really, really powerful moment uh, because Ajahn Ram told me he had just finished building Bodhinana Monastery. He had putting his entire life into Bodhinana Monastery. He was working like 12-hour days at least, floodlights in the evening so he could kind of carry on building. Yeah? And that was his life's work, pretty much, building up monastery. And it's really, really well built. I mean, when Ajahn Brahm puts his mind to something, it's like super duper built. In fact, he said he put, he did it too well, he told me later on, because it's impermanent, right? So why put so much effort into something that's impermanent? Uh, but anyway, really, really well built uh, and done, worked so hard for it. Uh, and then comes this fire, bushfires in Australia, notoriously dangerous. Uh, and so this was at the end of January, the, you know, towards the end of the dry season. This is summer season, summer season in Australia. And there hasn't been a rain for two months. And then comes the hottest day on record, 46.8 degrees, something like that at that time. Yeah? And then, then the fire comes. And so then they, uh, the fire brigade comes uh, and they, they all assemble in the main hall in the monastery. Uh, and the fire brigade says, well, we, this is the end of the monastery, we've got to evacuate. Uh, and so I said to Ajahn Mah, well, well, how did you feel at that moment when you knew that the monastery was going to burn down? He said, I let go. And I said, what? <laughs> You've just been building this thing for 10 years, doing everything in your life. This is your life's work. And you just let go just like that. How is that possible? And this is kind of where this comes in. This is exactly the thing with climate change and everything else. Yeah, All the same thing. Yeah? He said that the reason I could let go so fast is because I built that place not to build it. Yeah, That wasn't really the point. Okay, it's nice to have a monastery, but that wasn't really the point. The point was the spiritual qualities that I developed through that practice. I was doing it out of generosity. I was doing it out of kindness. I was doing something out of compassion to the world. That's why I was doing it. And if the place goes burns down, I can just restart tomorrow morning and build again, and that will be more compassion, more kindness. So I haven't lost anything, he said. You have only lost something if what the world turns out has meaning for you or is important to you. But if you understand the impermanence and unreliability of the world, you don't do it for that reason. You do it simply out of kindness and to build up spiritual qualities. So that was to me very, very powerful. And it shows you, I think, the solution to that, that issue. Yeah. Um, my question is about uh, dependent origination. Uh, you don't have to ask it. Uh, you don't have to answer a lot if it's okay. too long, but um, it's kind of threefold. It's um, because uh, ignorance is the first cause in the, the chain of twelve links. Um, why and how does that arise? And how is ignorance before consciousness? Because uh, isn't ignorance experiential? And 
finally, um, yeah, is it the nature of emptiness to give rise to ignorance, or is it simply that um, time is never beginning and never ending? So right. that question doesn't really make, make any sense because there's no like first cause. Right. Thank yes. You. Yes. You're, yeah. you're on the right track. There is, is the last one, right? Okay. Is, is that yes, you have to have consciousness to have ignorance because ignorance makes no sense without a human being or a being having ignorance, right? So it has to be consciousness has to be there. And so what the Buddha says, there is no first point of ignorance, uh, just as there is no first point of consciousness, uh, because they go together. Yeah. So that's, that's what you were saying, right? So that's basically the same idea. But you were also asking in the beginning. You were asking about where does ignorance come from? Uh, and that actually is an interesting question, uh, because even though there is no first point, uh, there still are causes for ignorance. Uh, yeah? And the, the causes, the conditions, the Buddha said in the suttas, is the five hindrances. Uh, yeah? We were just talking about that before, how to purify your mind and meditation. And so the five hindrances, uh, uh, if they are strong, uh, your ignorance is stronger. If they are weak, the ignorance is weaker. And this shows you how dependent origination unravels, yeah? how it comes to an end. Uh, because by eliminating the five hindrances, you have eliminated all the supports of ignorance. Uh, and when all the supports of ignorance are gone, then the structure, is, the structure of ignorance is weak. Yeah? It's like a house without uh, foundation or whatever. Uh, the so that at that moment, uh, it's relatively easy to have the insight that overcomes ignorance once and for all. Uh, you have removed the support. So the, it's not so much that they uh, are the causes of ignorance, but they are like the fu food and the fuel of ignorance, the nutriment of ignorance. Uh, I think that's what it's called, actually, in that sutta. If you want to look it up, it's in the Anguttara 1061, the Avijja Sutta, <coughs> Ignorance Sutta. Yeah. Does that, does that answer your whole question? Or? Um, I, I might have missed it, but... Um, yeah? Yeah, I might have missed it, but did, uh, how, how yeah. is ignorance, um, sp like before something like consciousness, meaning that there is ignorance, but there is no, there is nothing to view it. So um, what, what is doing ignorance, the ignorance? The ignorance doesn't come before consciousness. So, oh. you, so you, the, uh, the, the first, two, first two links, so you, so you have uh, yeah, independent origination, you're, you're right. So you have avidja, then sankara, then vinyana. Yeah? So it looks like ignorance comes first, then comes uh, volitional activities, then comes consciousness. Uh, but uh, this is just a, a, a way of systematizing things. Uh, so whenever there is ignorance, there's also consciousness. So there's consciousness at the beginning as well. Uh, yeah? it's, it's just that uh, this shows you how consciousness arises in a particular state in the future. Uh, it shows you the future development of consciousness. It doesn't mean that there is no consciousness with ignorance. Uh, yeah, there is consciousness with ignorance as well. The five khandhas are there all the way through. So what one way of thinking about dependent origination is thinking about it as the evolution of the five khandhas uh, and the various ways of looking at the five khandhas. So ignorance just means five khandhas with ignorance. Uh, yeah? Then the second one, sankara, is the focus on the activity of the five khandhas. Uh, then you look at the consciousness aspect, but the five khandhas are always there. So consciousness and, and avidja have, have always existed together. Yeah. yeah. As you said, they can't, you can't have ignorance without uh, consciousness. It doesn't make any sense, right? Uh, yeah. Anyone else? Can you hear me? Yes. Um, hear Ajahn Brahmale. Yeah. Um, it's such a, a privilege to be here. I've watched you online for years and years, so thank you very okay. much. Okay, good. Um, what would be your top tip for um, dispelling ego clinging? Ego clinging? Huh? Mm -hmm. uh, top tip was practice the Eightfold Path. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, because uh, it's interesting. The, uh, the, you know, the, the sense of self, um, it uh, will not like it that you practice in the Noble Eightfold Path. The sense of self will sometimes stand in the way here, yeah, because sometimes the self doesn't want to do what is right, doesn't want to be kind. Sometimes you want to tell that people, oh, person off, it's kind of the ego says, this person deserves it, whatever. And, or you get angry about something. So actually, by practicing the path, you're already, already reducing the ego, yeah, already. It's, it's happening automatically, yeah. And so, uh, so that's kind of, I think that's really all you have to do, yeah. <laughs>
And, but also, also, it can also be useful to understand the danger in the ego, you know, the suffering that it provides. Uh, yeah? How, I don't know about you, but sometimes when the ego kind of arises, I feel it, it feels really kind of uh, yucky. Uh, yeah, the ego, it feels yucky. It feels like you know, this, this is, there's some hardness to it. There's a kind of lack of, uh, lack of uh, um, it, you know, ability to change. You know, the, the ego kind of gets stuck into things. And there's something about it which is not nice. The ego is, some, is actually not, very, it's not a beautiful thing. So thinking about it, that, that can, be, can be helpful to remind yourself that this actually is not beautiful. It, it makes you stuck in samsara, basically. Uh, and... Um, uh, yeah, and, and also just the general dukkha of the ego. I, you know, one of, this is one of the nice things that you start to see in meditation practice, that as you meditate, uh, you know, the ego, manif the one way it manifests is through thinking mind. Uh, yeah, the ego talking, yeah. And so when the mind doesn't think, you feel much, you feel much better, right? Uh, it's actually really nice when things become peaceful. Uh, so the ego is a nuisance, uh, yeah. <laughs> and so, so these are some of the ways of, uh, yeah. 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 Okay. Good. So, uh, uh, it's a few words. So, uh, what time do we have to leave, uh, Venerable Ani? Is there a what? What, what are the limits? Our higher time is quarter two. You can't time is quarter two. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we have five minutes. Then because, yeah. yeah. They want us to leave. Yeah. Nine. Okay. All right. Okay. So we have, we have to kind of get get ready for that. Okay. So I just wanted to, one of the reasons I'm here, main reason I'm here is to teach the Dhamma because I think this is, the, this is what this is all about. And this is also what Anukampa project is, Bikini project is ultimately about, which is the project led by Venerable Chanda, which is now they're trying to establish a monastery at, just outside of Oxford. Uh, I haven't seen it yet, but I've seen the pictures and it looks uh, blim and marvelous. It looks really nice. Uh, so it's gonna, I think it's going to be a really, really wonderful place. Uh, and I think this is a requirement for Buddhism to kind of flourish in a place that you have good monasteries. Uh, and the idea of the lay community and the monastics kind of working together is a very, very powerful thing here. And I think we all kind of prosper from that mutual support that we give each other in this way here. And uh, it has been very difficult for women to practice properly in the Buddhist world, especially as monastics, especially as fully ordained monastics. One of the uh, special things about the uh, uh, Anukampa project uh, is that it is for bhikkhunis, which are fully ordained nuns. Uh, so in other words, they have the same, basically like a bhikkhu, so uh, this is what I am, fully ordained monk, yeah, fully ordained nun, yeah, same kind of idea. And that means that you are practicing the path of the Buddha fully rather than partially. Most women in the world, they practice according to eight precepts or ten precepts or whatever, but not, don't really practice it fully. They don't practice it the way it was laid down by the Buddha, whereas this is then going back to the roots of how the nuns practiced in the ancient times. So it's wonderful to have that opportunity, and it's great to see it happening here in the UK. In Australia, we have already been doing it for a while. In Sri Lanka, they have been doing it for a while already. They have been going on. It's, the quality is not always as good as it, uh, we had hoped for, but it's actually happening, and eventually some very good bikinis are going to come out. In fact, uh, I was in Sri Lanka recently, and uh, I met some of the bikinis there, and some of them were great, yeah, really good meditators and wonderful, wonderful people. Uh, so that was actually very encouraging. So I would uh, urge you all, if you have the opportunity, to uh, you know, help out a bit, if you can, with the uh, Anukampa project in Venerable Chanda, because I think it is a very important to get that fourth pillar of Buddhism properly established again. The four pillars of Buddhism are uh, the lay men and lay women, the monks, and also the nuns. Yeah? These are the four pillars. Uh, and so by, or four assemblies, as you recalled in the suttas, uh, then we get that uh, back on track again. And this is going to make Buddhism much stronger and more powerful and more uh, uh, complete for the future. Uh, so uh, I'm really happy. Thank you for doing this. Uh, it's wonderful. Uh, yeah, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Uh, would you like to add anything, Venerable? Uh, uh, well, thank you very much for that really wonderful and pretty detailed talk. Considering your jet lag, that was... So I really appreciated that and hopefully it was helpful for others too. Usually it's, um, you can't take everything in, but the bits that are important you kind of keep in your heart and help to guide the practice internally. So 
a really wonderful talk. And yes, I do want to say just a few words to really welcome you to come and visit our monastery. Because on the outset, on the outside, it looks like a monastery for nuns, and that is the purpose, to train more bhikkhunis to be able to um, practice the teachings and also share the teachings. And just recently, actually, I was writing off a, an answer to a question we've been asked by, I think, I don't think it's the Charity Commission, it's probably the Council, to enable us to get registered as sponsors for foreign aspirants, for visas, in other words, from overseas um, people who would like to train with us. And we had to tell about all the outreach we have. And whilst on the surface it looks as though maybe on average we get like seven people in the monastery every day, sometimes less, sometimes a bit more, when you actually look at the overall outreach it's probably closer to 10, 20,000 people, and 3,000 of those are regular. And so really this just shows that even, you know, a few people who practice well, or, you know, a couple of monastics found in one place, have an outreach of thousands of people. And it creates community, which is global, you know, which is international. So when we look at our kind of mailing list, it's 45% from the UK and 55 from everywhere else in the world. So. It really has an incredible benefit for humanity in the sense that, you know, not only does it reach outwards, but imagine each of those several thousand people reaching their own communities too, you know, and changing the people around them, the societies around them for the better too, by their own practice. So it's really huge, and uh, I feel very blessed to have uh, finally, with the support of people internationally, been able to get a beautiful place in a secluded yet accessible location full of forest around us. It's just surrounded. We find different um, footpaths and nature reserves and forested areas every evening on our wildlife walks and yet it's accessible as well. It's near to Oxford so people can come along. And we're starting to actually meet people like on the little lanes around the property who get excited and then end up coming once a week to do some gardening, you know, or popping in for the evening tea and if they have time, joining in with the meditation as well. So it's becoming a community place. It's a small community, but it's a kind of rich one in the sense that we know each and every person involved. And many of you are here. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if all of you, if not, well, 90% of you have come through our newsletter. Um, and it's beautiful for each person coming to meet spiritual friends. So it's starting to feel like, although you know it's for the Bikuni Sangha, it's for the Fourfold Assembly, um, it's the Fourfold Assembly that really strengthens through this. And we have the opportunity to train women as well. So I don't know if any of you are mm -hmm. kind of young enough or detached enough from your hair. <laughs> <laughs> But the opportunity is there, and it's when the opportunity is there that people actually see it as, as an option. You know, until it's visible, then how can people make a choice for that? So, yeah, it's part of something global, and as everyone says, you know, it's, uh, it's happening in Sri Lanka, it's happening a little bit everywhere, but there's a lot of, um, I wouldn't call it burden, but stress or weight, maybe, like a big job <laughs> when there's only one or two. So we need your support to, uh, to make ourselves strong and to make the community able to serve. Mm -hmm. I, think it's, I think it's really important to have uh, women, female monastic. I think it really matters. And I, I think, first of all, it's important because we want to give women the full opportunity to practice the spiritual life fully, just like we do for you know, men and that side of it. But also I think that women bring, they have, a, I mean, we are being socialized slightly differently, yeah, men and women. So you bring a slightly different perspective on life to bear on the Buddhist teachings. And I think that is very useful. It can actually give a slightly different angle on things. And one of the things that I notice with women, which I think I really like about women's Dhamma, it is often quite practical. It deals with practical issues. And I think, I don't know about, but it's those men that I know, they have, they have, they have a tendency, they, they tend to be a bit more kind of theoretical and uh, inclined maybe. And I, so, I mean, this is just a generalization. But, but anyway, my point is just that there is a difference uh, between sometimes, and that's kind of very useful. Huh? 
Yeah, one of the things to um, just mention in response to that is um, the power of actually seeing a dual Sangha teach together. And this is something I've been doing in Norway for the last couple of years. And I think, yes, there's a difference generally, right? But we're all different from each other. But when you do see a monk and a non teach together, and you know, there are all kinds of people who come to receive the teachings, it just feels more balanced, right? Melanie's been there, Minori, who's now left the hall, has been there in Norway, and Matthias as well. And overwhelming people have said to me afterwards, every retreat should be dual sangha, you know, because there's just something harmonious about it. And I think it's about representation. You know, we need to see each other, we need to see ourselves uh, represented to really make it seem possible for us. So it's not just about gender, it's about race, it's about, you know, all genders, right? It's about the LGBTQIA plus community. It's about, you know, hopefully all ages, you know, trying to make these things accessible to everybody of various ages, various abilities. And also neurodiversity too. So I think the bigger community can be and the better represented it can be, the more people we can reach. So. Yeah, thank you everybody really for being involved and you can find out more about how to come and visit, how to offer food or um, help to contribute towards our running costs, etc, etc. And come to our events as well, you can find out more outside. And um, yeah, we're, we're going to be here with Ajahn Pamali in another few days. So tomorrow we're going down to Brighton, which is not far from London. You can still come along, even if you haven't got a ticket yet, you can just come and pay on the door or give a donation. And then we're going to be in Oxford for a couple of days, and then in Bristol. And after that, um, Ajahn Brown, our teacher, and myself are teaching an online retreat, so there's still space on that as well. And I uh, just hope to see you somewhere along the way. So thank you very much for being here, and thank you again to thank Ajahn you. Brown. Thank yeah. you. And to Venerable Lepena, <laughs> who is my Bikuni companion, uh -huh. coming all the way from Perth for the second time, and it's really special to be two of us in the monastery at this time. So. Absolutely. Okay, thanks everyone. Uh, nice to see you all again there. Mm -hmm. it's familiar faces and some new faces. Do you know Ajahn Brown's way of ending a talk? It's the Anukampa way too. Sadhu. 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 <laughs> that was like 50%, but yeah, we're just starting the you tour. You was like 150 or something, I'm wrong.